What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for being here this evening. Welcome to the Tattooed Historian's Twitch channel. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. A lot of you know that we do gaming here, but we also have started doing interviews. And today, I'm so happy to have Kyle Dalton on to talk about museums and narrative game design. Before I uh, uh, say hello to Kyle, I do want to say hello and give a shout out to my three new followers. Some of you may be from Emerging Museum Professionals on Facebook. Uh, uh, Super Button Mash, Melissa in Denial, and Bio Arch Mark. Thank you so much for following. Kyle, how are you today? Doing all right. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm trying to stay cool. It's hot as hell out there. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> we're hitting a heat wave here. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it's probably true for most of the country and, and wherever you are. Yeah, it's like uh, getting into the low 90s now. We're getting ready to. And, uh, you know, it's a great weight loss program, though. I'm enjoying sweating <laughs> so much, you know. Uh, but but I'm really excited about this uh, program tonight, Kyle, because this is something that has interested me since I started my Twitch channel. And I know there are a few other historians on Twitch who feel the same way, where we started out kind of like in historical gaming and, and public history and now talking about meshing the two together and maybe we've been doing things uh, over the years, realizing that it's kind of game like and we never really realized it. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of uh, the core of how to make game design work in museums. Uh, if your audience realizes that it's a game, it doesn't work that well. Mm, that's true. Yeah, because I, I found that when. I get a lot of people who, when I say, oh, I'm a historian, but I also game on Twitch, and they're like, well, I don't want anything to do with gaming. I, I don't <laughs> want anything to do with that. And yet they're going to museums or public uh, history sites, uh, battlefields, historical homes, and they're interacting electronically with things, not realizing that that could be the door opening to gaming and narrative gaming in a museum setting. And that reputation of games as a thing that are inaccessible uh, to mature audiences is one that games have kind of earned. <laughs> We've seen plenty of uh, uh, bad, bad games out there. Uh, and they did start as a juvenile toy, as a thing that wasn't meant to be a serious medium for telling big stories. It was physically incapable of doing that uh, when video games really took off in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and, and in the 90s, you saw attempts at it, but it was still dealing with that legacy of being a child's toy. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and having stories that were kind of fairy tale-y or uh, over the top. Uh, and we're still dealing with a bit of that today, too. That legacy continues now. But it's existing alongside uh, some very mature stories uh, that are being told through a medium that allows for interactivity. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's really where museums could learn from, uh, is the way you interact with something tells part of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember in the in the pre-COVID world when we could do a lot more interacting uh, with touch uh, touching uh, you know the screens and and doing stuff like that. And now we're starting to slowly get back to that. But uh, I I remember when we when we brought up the idea of doing this, I started to think about ways we may have done it uh, twenty years ago. Let's say where we're interacting in different ways with museums, and I remember uh, probably about twenty. I don't know, 24, 23 years ago. I remember it was the first time I went to Pamplin Historical Park and they gave Ooh. me that little card that said, you're this soldier and you need to scan this and showcase this. You're taking on a different, you're role playing yeah. really in that way. And you don't think about it at the time that it's a role play uh, event, but you're actually doing that. So it's kind of like, what else have we experienced where we're like, oh, that's what this, that's what this could lead to. Yeah, and uh, in the world of game design, the way that you use mechanics to tell stories uh, is called ludonarrative. Uh, ludo meaning play, narrative meaning narrative. It's mm -hmm. telling the story through play. Uh, and that can be done interactively in museums. And we've been doing it that way for, for many decades, uh, well before video games were a thing. Uh, of, you know, hey, let's try your hand at making this thing. Try holding this musket. To, Get how it fe feel how heavy it is, uh, you know that kind of a thing. But mm -hmm. museums are getting much more sophisticated about that. Have you been to the um, National Museum of African American History? In uh, I have not had the chance yet. I've been wanting to forever. Oh, man, you've got to go. It is yeah. an amazing exhibit based experience. Uh, but what's interesting about that space? The reason I think of it in the ludo narrative way 
is that just walking through the museum, it tells you the story. So the very first space you enter, there's two walls. On one, it's the history of Europe before contact. On the other, it's Africa before contact uh, or very early contact. And they're, they're further apart as you start and they get closer together as you progress. Uh, and both walls are chronological. They intentionally bottleneck. And this happens several times throughout the museum experience. They intentionally bottleneck you to tell a narrative point. Uh, mm -hmm. And that then enters the transatlantic slave trade. You enter a much more crowded space. Uh, you enter a space that's a little bit more uncomfortable and one that you should not feel like you want to spend a lot of time in. Uh, it doesn't replicate the trauma of the Middle Passage, nor should it, right. but it evokes an idea of it. Uh, and they do that simply through the design of the exhibits. Without any text, without any artifacts, they're telling a story through the architectural space. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, again, where museums could learn a lot uh, mm -hmm. from, from Ludo narrative. Yeah, that's, a, that's fascinating because you, uh, a lot of us visit museums and we don't think about the architectural design and how it inhibits or allows our movements through it and how that helps tell the story. Like you, like the one you just mentioned, I can't wait to visit that museum because it's been an open for a while and I haven't had the honor yet, but I, I definitely want to go. Uh, I remember, you know, the first time I went to the, the Holocaust Museum and you go in the railroad car. Yeah. And it's one of those things. And, and it was so interesting because you didn't have to. They allowed you to go around it. And that's when you realize the psychological power of museums, because it's like, we know this could affect you. If you don't wish right. to do it, you can go around and, and, and not be a part of that if you think that's gonna be too emotional for you. So using that space and creating that space to create, uh, in, in the case of what you brought up, almost like a tension you know, yes. spot where everything is coming together and, and, and your world is getting smaller around you in that museum environment or knowing that symbology of that artifact, like a railroad car at the Holocaust Museum and what that can create is a fascinating thing in, in the psychology of public history. Oh yeah, and, and that's something too that, um, I think it's also important not only to talk about how game design can inspire us for programming for exhibits and stuff, but also the ways in which it can't, uh, or mm -hmm. things that we shouldn't try to replicate. Right. Uh, there, and I think a lot of game designers understand this too. There are certain topics that are addressed very rarely in games. For all the World War II games that exist out there, there are no Holocaust games and there probably shouldn't be. <laughs> it's something right. that should get addressed. If we have all these World War II games, we never mention the Holocaust, we're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, also you don't want to replicate uh, something that is that traumatic to your audience. Uh, and in the case of games can be glorified, can be modified by a negative community, can be um, exploited in a certain way. Um, one game I keep returning to for a model of narrative game design is Red Dead Redemption 2. Have you played that? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's great. It. Yeah. Um, but the first social media controversy on there, they introduce, they have several plot lines that deal with the suffrage movement. Uh, and one of the early uh, controversies on YouTube was there was this alt-right gamer who would go and kidnap one of these women and kill her in various ways, throwing her to crocodiles, blowing her up, all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. The game was not designed for that. It was not encouraged. It was actively discouraged, but it wasn't forbidden. And that created a really awful space for something like that to be exploited. Right. Uh, again, they probably didn't even anticipate that it would be exploited again and again and again by a literal psychopath. Uh, but it's something that happens. And that's something we also see in living history spaces in museums. If it's that open and free, you do have to be aware that there is a very small but active part of a potential museum audience that can exploit that and take those traumatic moments, those powerful moments, and completely undermine them. Yeah, and, and you as the host or you as the game developer now are are saddled with, and I don't mean that to be a pun on Red Dead Redemption, uh, you're, you're saddled with having to now uh, do damage control where you're right. like, hey, that is not the reason why we did this or hosted this group or whatever it may be to come do an interpretive experience. And now you're, that's on you now to clean it up. But it's also a great way to provide uh, context as to your mission 
as well and say, that's absolutely not what we had in mind. We're sorry that occurred. Here's what our mission is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and clean that up as quickly as possible. Because this day and age, you have to clean it up ASAP because it's everywhere then, you know, yeah. so quickly. And plus, you should clean it up ASAP. Yeah. You, know, you shouldn't <laughs> let that stuff it's simmer. The right thing to do. <laughs> right, right. Right. Yeah. The one there's a there's a game out there um, that I've enjoyed playing, which is uh, Through the Darkest of Times. And it's it's about uh, resistance to the rise of the Nazi party. And it's really, really interesting because you're leading like this small group of people and you actually handpick the people hmm. to to go around and you send this person off to um uh print flyers and you send this person off to to fundraise and you send this person off to find other recruits and it's really really interesting because we brought up the the holocaust issue and stuff like that the idea of resistance to that thing provide that event brings us to a different level of interactivity where that could become something in a museum environment on resistance where right. where you're where you're talking about that kind of thing, like how would you resist this if it if you were in their shoes? So speaking of resistance and difficult historical topics and games as inspiration, um, my first real attempt to apply uh, Ludo narrative game design to a museum experience was uh, back when I was working with Historic London Town. Uh, we had a group of, of living historians say we want to do an immersion weekend there. Um, for anybody in the audience who uh, doesn't dress in funny clothes, uh, that's <laughs> that's where they go and they try to be as authentic as possible. Like every everything, the food has to be in season for that region. Uh, they they have to sleep on the beds like they would. Um, they can only use language they would have back then. The whole bit. The thing with an immersion weekend, though, is that it is uh, intended for the living historians and nobody else. Uh, it's mm. not meant for the public. Mm -hmm. uh, it, going back to kind of that role play idea you had. That's really cool right. for them. But right. for a, a museum that's trying to reach an audience, it doesn't always work out. Uh, what, what is the incentive to use that space in that way? So we said, okay, you can do that, but you have to interact with the public. And here's where we're going to try game design. Everybody got a character, somebody who actually existed in that time. We gave them all the historical information we had on those individuals. And then we tasked them with coming up with ideas of how to get the public to help them. We had one guy planting a garden. He had people go in there and actually help him um, pull weeds and plant seeds. Um, we had uh, two indentured servants. Uh, actually, one was a convict servant. Uh, in separate households that we knew eventually got married. So they were uh, asking people to pass letters between mm. them. Um, we had people carrying um, notes as though they were lawyers delivering uh, information about, hey, it's time to pay up your debt. Right. Um, but it's set in the 18th century. It's colonial Maryland. Uh, the town was majority enslaved. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to address that. Um, mm -hmm. Thankfully, Nastasha Parker, who's, who's very good, um, was there. And she came up with this idea of using fetch quests. Uh, I know most people on here are probably gamers. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you know what a fetch quest yes, is. Yes, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, this was a really interesting way of trying out uh, a game idea in a sensitive topic in a controlled setting. Uh, so right. her idea was uh, her character, her enslaved person, was going to try to escape but needed certain items to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, and rather than most fetch quests, which are boring grinding bull, <laughs> right. uh, where you have to go right. get like six eggs for no reason, yeah. and get a sword or something. Yeah. Uh, in this one, each of the items did have a purpose. Um, you had to get a pass, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. Since her enslaved character could not write, you had to go to somebody who could and convince them to do so. Uh, which then also brings in sort of the nuances of slavery, where uh, there are people who may not be enslavers, but are complicit in the system and are incentivized to stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of stuff like that. And it went really well. But one thing that none of us anticipated, uh, Nastasha even didn't anticipate this, was how taxing it would be on her. Uh, mm -hmm. She really like had to do this multiple times for a whole weekend, uh, embodying an enslaved person, even without any direct abuse, even without indirect abuse, right. it was simulating abuse and it was too much. Right. Uh, and 
that's part of the things you're going to have to weigh. Uh, how much is historical recreation possible? Uh, and how much is it ethical, even with the people you're working with who, who understand what they're getting into? Correct. And we think about that. We think about the ethical end of it uh, so much when we talk about gaming in history or gaming in museums or narrative gaming in museums. We think about the ethical end of that so much because we don't want to make history seem like it was a game. <laughs> you right. know, it's, yeah. it's, it's life. You know, that's the way it was. Uh, I, I want to thank Melody of Green Gables and Chava Mara for their follows. Chava Mara actually has a great thing. There's a game called Never Forget About a Child's Imagining of Her Experience in the Holocaust. That game does not warn you that you're in the Holocaust until the very end, which is very upsetting. Wow. Oh, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah. I don't, uh, I've never heard of this game. I haven't uh, either, actually. I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to <laughs> be a part of that. That's, that's wild. Uh, yeah, I, I can see how there's the germ of a good idea there, but I don't, I don't yeah. know if I would, if I would have made that same choice. Uh, it, yeah. it reminds me a little bit. Have you played um, Wolfenstein: The New Order? I have not. I, I've, I've seen it, but I haven't played it. For the most part, the narrative is really good at walking this tightrope between being overtly silly, uh, B-movie schlock, and mm -hmm. also getting really into why the Nazis are the bad guys. They, they do a really good job of it for the most part, but there is an entire level taking place in a concentration camp. Oh. And even though I can't think of how they could have done it better while walking that tightrope, I still feel like it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they just shouldn't have tried. Uh, that, yeah. you know, you've, you can say a lot about the Holocaust without recreating it. Uh, right. You can say a lot about na Nazi ideology without actually showing the genocide. Uh, right. Not to say that it should never be shown. It's just I'm not sure that that was the best medium to do so uh, or that yeah. that example. Uh, I think there are, there are ways that it can be done more sensitively uh, and not as schlocky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a tight rope you have to walk when you're doing such topics because there are mediums where that is permissible. And then there are right. mediums where you know, that's just not the direction to, to go with it. You know, it's fine to be controversial as long as you're correct. But at the same time, it's kind of like you got to look for the, is it tasteful or not? Is that the right. tasteful thing to do? Is that the Could right? Could you have accomplished that same narrative beat in another way? Correct. Uh, and again, not like it can never be addressed. And I mean, video games right. as a medium is, is gigantic. It's huge. There's sure. so many different ways to do things. I don't want to say it can never be done. Um, I think there is the possibility that it could be, uh, thinking of movies, for example, uh, there's lots of depictions of the Holocaust in movies, some of which are terrible mm -hmm. and others are moving and incredible and really add to, uh, the popular culture understanding mm -hmm. of this momentous event. So I'm not saying that games can never do it. Uh, but it is something you got to be really careful about. And that's true of museum programming as well. Museums dig into the Holocaust all the time. We dig into slavery right. all the time. We right. should. That is our mandate. Uh, but the ways in which you do so, and there are some pretty high profile failures, uh, mm -hmm. can reflect on your museum. The experience that, that people have at your museum can be negatively, negatively impacted if you're not thinking about how people are engaging with it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I've uh, thought about when there was that whole controversy, I believe, in the 1990s about the Enola Gay. Yes. And, and a lot of us who have been public historians had to study that that whole episode of, like, do yeah. we display the Enola Gay? Do we not display the Enola Gay? Uh, how do we tell the story? And stuff like that. And I've often thought about, uh, you know, ways in which some of us who game regularly – we're playing like World of War planes and we're playing all this stuff. And it's like, we are one step away from discussing this issue uh, and, and how close we are as historians and public historians to that, that particular um, subject matter that we have to cover and we have to touch on because you're doing so much in these games. It's so very close to that. I mean, there's, I don't yes. think there's any World War II game where you drop the atomic bomb. I don't think so. But like the new, the newer stuff of uh, uh, Call of Duty and stuff with modern warfare, they're dropping nuclear warheads and all this other stuff, and it's like, yeah. okay, we're we're at that point now where maybe we need to discuss this. 
And that is another thing I think that museums can learn from games uh, is museums are the most trusted medium in America uh, mm -hmm. by far. There's some great research by Colleen Dillon Schneider on this. Uh, about how trusted museums are. Uh, the mm -hmm. American Association of Museums uh, also has studies that, that really back this up. Uh, the AAM studies found that museums were more trusted than people who lived the event. Uh, okay. That people would say that they trusted museums more to give an objective perspective than their own family members. Wow. Uh, that is an incredible trust. Yeah. And one that I don't wanna say we earned, but one that we got from often pulling our punches. Uh, and mm -hmm. you're seeing that in games too. The problem is as games are getting more sophisticated, as our museum audience is getting more demanding of, of different perspectives, right. uh, they're noticing that you're pulling those punches. Call of Duty is a great example of that. Call mm -hmm. of Duty is constantly screaming that they're not political, but they're showing green berets uh, shooting terrorists and working with uh, the Masood agents. I mean, it's it's pretty clearly a political. There's geopolitical stuff there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there has uh, to be. And there's there's some great videos about that uh, and, and articles about how you can scream as much as you want that you're not making a statement, but by not making a statement and showing the things you're showing, you're making a statement. And the same thing is true for museums. The programs that we do, the exhibits that we create, they all send a message, uh, mm -hmm. and. We often get uh, this thing, I work at a Civil War museum, we often get this thing of uh, don't be too political. You know, the famously apolitical Civil War had nothing to do yeah, with politics. Nothing to do with politics. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> we're making statements. It, no matter right. what we do, no matter what mm -hmm. we say, we are making a statement. Uh, there's literally no way around that. Uh, right. And so you need to embrace that. You need to say, what is the argument that I'm making here? You can put walls around that argument. You can say, this is the, the argument that we're making, but you've got mm -hmm. to make that argument. Games mm -hmm. are often very bad at that, and so too are museums. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say that as far as the games are concerned, sometimes they go more for the shock value right? because it gets clicks. Then that, and and I would say that it's not their job really to teach history at all. It's their job to entertain, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, to at least spark that curiosity. It's our job as public historians and and academics who may be watching or or whoever else to grasp that and say, okay, we're going to draw you in by utilizing what you're playing now yeah. and possibly have some interactivity in our museum or historical site that peaks that gaming interest in your head and moving right. forward there. I just saw there's a battleship, I believe it's a battleship in Europe, uh, in some European dock where now you can go on board and there's a certain part of the ship where you can play World of Warships on the ship. <laughs> and it's like, see, that's that's what I'm talking about. You're, yeah. you're taking the people who want to play World of Warships and they're like, oh, well now I can play it on a ship. And now you're getting people through the door <laughs> who may not have come through and and that's the new level of kind of like interactivity with the space itself right. because you can be like oh this looks exactly like this part in this and etc um i do want to get we, we shouldn't diminish too much to the right. educational value that you can get from games uh, mm -hmm. The British Ecological Society just a week ago, not even a week ago, July 8th, uh, released a study in which they found that people who play Red Dead Redemption 2 uh, are better at identifying the native species of North America than people who don't. Uh, they're on average able to name like 40% more or something yeah. like that. Um, and that yeah. is simply through playing the game. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, um, that's awesome. oh shoot, what's the word for it? Uh uh, I can't remember the name right now, but there's there's this uh, this thing in game design uh, where people learn by osmosis. They're not learning because they're setting out to learn. They're learning because that's part of the process. And that's another thing I think museums can pick up on. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people go to museums for entertainment. Uh, there mm -hmm. was this study years and years ago by the National Park Service that found that people who went to museums for fun learned more than people who went to museums to learn. Hmm. If you're engaging right. with the material, if you're yeah. actively enjoying the thing you do, you can get a lot more out of it. Uh, and, and again, I think that's something that, that we can learn from games. Games are really good at dropping those little Easter eggs uh, or having you do uh, repetitious activities that don't feel repetitious, like hunting in Red Dead, uh, mm -hmm. that, that can actually educate in important ways.
Yeah, that's a great point. I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, Melody of Green Gables followed her. Thank you for that. Uh, I got a great thing from her. Uh, the community engagement model for exhibit development is a great way to catch narrative pitfalls or oversights in the creation process. Uh, you want to touch on that, Kyle? That's that's an, that's a great oh, statement. Yeah. Um, this is a thing that games have learned the hard way uh, and that museums are still learning. Uh, and to be yeah. fair, a lot of games are still learning. Uh, the idea of using the community to help you tell your story uh, is critical. It's totally key. Uh, there are some great examples of this in games. Uh, Never Alone uh, was made by an Inuit mm. community and is fantastic. Mm. Yes. Um, whereas, uh, say a game like... Um, uh, Assassin's Creed 3, set in the revolution. There's a lot of uh, American Indian voice actors, specifically Mohawk voice actors, which is really cool, but they don't integrate the culture at all. Uh, it shows up at the very beginning. Uh, there's some long houses, uh, they get burned down, and then your character leaves and basically never returns, just mm -hmm. is no longer part of the native community. Mm -hmm. um, as much as they touted his nativeness, uh, they didn't really integrate the Iroquois Confederacy, uh, or specifically the culture of the Mohawk at all, at any stage, uh, it became an aesthetic and not a th a who he was. Mm -hmm. And that's something um, that you see a lot in games uh, and in museums. Uh, there's a, a, an exhibit that recently went up that I'm not going to name uh, at a museum that I'm not going to name <laughs> uh, that uh, was all about uh, immigrants in a community, but they explicitly excluded African-Americans. Uh, their thinking behind it, which in a tortured way kind of makes sense, uh, is that uh, it wasn't immigration, it was slavery. Which, okay, kind of, yeah, that's, I get that, that makes sense. Um, but they're not talking about slavery either. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're also not including any black people, so it doesn't include actual immigrants from Africa. And it becomes this weirdly exclusive thing where they clearly didn't work with the community. They clearly didn't talk to the people of the place. Mm -hmm. And that backfired horrifically. Uh, the, the exhibit really doesn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's something that museums need to be very careful about. We're gonna fall into that Assassin's Creed 3 trap uh, where we start embracing aesthetics, we start telling stories, but we don't put it in context and we miss really key critical items. It sounds almost like some uh, like the Assassin's Creed model that you brought up, and uh, possibly some other uh, gaming uh, developers out there. They check the box and they move on, and yeah. because to them it could be uncomfortable, or they don't know enough about it, and they don't know who to talk to about it. Right. And they're like, okay, we we included them next. Yeah, and actually, that kind of brings me back to Wolfenstein and the Holocaust thing. At least they took the chance. At least they tried to tell that story. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it didn't work. And in retrospect, probably shouldn't have done it. But at least they tried to talk about the Holocaust when so many others don't. Uh, and uh, there's a great video essay on this um, by Jacob Geller, um, uh, Whiteness, Judaism, and Wolfenstein. Uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. on YouTube. And he talks a lot about his experiences as a, a Jewish person playing the Wolfenstein games uh, and how they deal with these sensitive topics. And he has a lot of praise for them. Um, but again, they, they at least were trying to tell that story. They were at least trying to include it. Uh, right. Whereas a lot of other games, as you said, they're checking boxes. They're like, right. hey, we got, a, we got a native main character. That means we've covered the culture. We're good. Let's move mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you got to go a little further than just like letting him speak his language for five minutes out of your hundred hour runtime. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm really hoping and I'm seeing this uh, with larger game developers. I'm not seeing it as much with smaller game developers yet, like independents. But larger game developers will have historians on staff or researchers on staff, which if you're a history student right now, uh, could be a good track to go down. <laughs> Because we're talking about a, <laughs> we're talking about like a three quarter of a trillion dollar industry here. It's oh not yeah, go, it's not going to go anywhere. No. And uh, <laughs> and look, you're seeing historians on Twitch now, so it's not going to go anywhere. A lot of us believe this is the next phase of uh, the history mm -hmm. field as far as getting the, the word out. Um, so I'm thinking that as they bring on uh, new graduates, old school historians, whoever it may be, to be advisors and researchers that 
model could change. However, there's still, to me, that kind of divide between popular large brands of uh, history-based games and the independents, because the independents seem to take more uh, urgent looks at the historical narrative because they can actually like hire an adjunct or hire uh, someone who wrote a book or something like that to be like, Hey, how, what did this look like? Um, you know, I think that, that might be something else where there's a little bit of a divide. Yeah. Well, and I think there's also, um, you have to bear in mind that there's a lot of video games out there. Oh, this yeah. is something that, uh, okay. that I can relate to as a museum professional. There are more museums in this country than there are McDonald's and Starbucks combined. And there is a <laughs> finite amount of money that these museums can get. Uh, and there's a finite mm -hmm. audience. Only a third of Americans, uh, by Colin Dillon Dill Schneider's research, going back to her, only a third of Americans uh, go to museums more than once a year. Uh, and another third actively avoid museums. You've got a very finite audience, which is growing, but it's still a finite audience. You've got a finite mm -hmm. amount of money, uh, and you have high competition, especially here in the mid-Atlantic. There's 80 museums in D.C. alone. Uh, yeah. it's, it is a difficult marketplace to compete in. And that means that you've got to be careful about how you use your resources. And those smaller studios is the same thing. There was an article several years ago about how, um, 37% of all games on steam have never been played. Oh, There's wow. so many games out there yeah. that they've literally never been played. Wow. Uh, and that is a very competitive market. And it means that most of these small studios, even if they could afford a historian, is that the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. uh, I think a good example of independent games or small developers that have done a great job with history, despite uh, a lack of a professional on site, uh, would be Papers, Please and um, uh, The Mystery of the Ober Den. Okay. Uh, or I think, it's, I think that's the official title. Both of them okay. are made by the same guy. Papers, Please is uh, you play a border guard at a um, Soviet bloc Eastern European country uh, that is trying to, to get people passed through, uh, mm -hmm. trying to inspect people as they come and go. And you have to make hard decisions about who you admit and who you deny. Wow. Uh, and the better you are at your job, the more that you get out of it financially, but you're also seeing some of your friends shipped off, uh, sent to prison. Uh, you're seeing um, people who are seeking a better life, refugees fleeing a civil war. You're turning them away at the gate. And it really tugs at your heartstrings and, and really makes you understand why this institution engenders injustice. Because if you're a good person, if you're a pure hearted human, uh, you will fail at your job and mm -hmm. you won't be able to help anybody then. Uh, mm -hmm. If, however, you're very good at your job, you're heartless. And there is no winning answer to that. Um, Obra Dinn, on the other hand, uh, again, made by the same guy, uh, is about a ghost ship that sails back seemingly on its own uh, to port in England. And you as an insurance adjuster have to figure out what happened to it. And that means using the ship's log uh, and finding where people died and trying to piece them all together. And it creates mm. this really intricate interlaced picture of a early 19th century sail ship uh, and it, it's fantastic at as as a maritime guy. I got my my stuff here. Yeah, uh, yeah. As a maritime guy, it is on the nose in a way that I have not yeah. seen in any other maritime game for the intimate world, uh, the intimate wooden world uh, of mm -hmm. the period. And again, this guy, he's not a historian of either of these periods. He's not a historian of uh, late Soviet bloc Eastern Europe, uh, and he's not a maritime historian but he's managed to capture both of those in really important ways. Uh, so I think there's also something to be said for capturing the feeling of something without necessarily right. being an expert on it. That's fantastic. Uh, Mark uh, from Epic Experience needs to know, what's the name of the ghost ship game? Okay, now I gotta look it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll get it to you, everyone. It's, it's Return coming. of the Obra Din. Uh, O-B-R-A-D-I-N-N. There you go, everybody. Return, Return of the, the Obra Dinn. Dinn. Um, And actually, that I, I brought that game up in a completely different context in a, in a, a podcast I was on, uh, History Respawn, um, with uh, Professor Whitaker. Um, okay. Great series. Uh, definitely recommend listening to it. Um, but he had asked about VR experiences in museums. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever had a VR experience in a museum? I have never, I've never had a VR experience in a museum, but I have VR. 
because oh, <laughs> I, I wanted to figure out what's out there in the history field where it's like a going through Rome or going through that. Sure. And this is the next step for me is figuring this out and reviewing it. So I've never done it in a museum setting. I've only ever done it at home. Yeah. And I, I think it's an interesting, uh, an interesting needle to thread uh, when it comes to VR in, in uh, museums. Mm -hmm. I've only ever done like those big simulators mm -hmm. at like air and space museums where they're like, Hey, fly this yeah. biplane. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm all about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think uh, it's also, there's some places where it doesn't really work. Uh, Oberdin is, is the best recreation of an early 19th century sail ship I've ever seen. Um, but I would rather just be on the deck of the Constitution if I'm visiting the Constitution. Right. Uh, and that's that's an important line to draw. What are you building and can it be delivered otherwise? People go to museums to have experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm on the streets of Williamsburg, a VR headset's just going to get in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, if right. I'm on Culp's Hill, same deal. It's, right. it's really not going to add anything to the atmosphere. It will only subtract. Right. But as you said, if you're in the ruins of ancient Rome, wouldn't it be cool to see it at its height? Wouldn't it be cool to see these buildings standing again? Wouldn't it be cool to see the people walking the streets, hawking their wares or whatever? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's a space for it, but I think we got to be careful about how we apply it. I think we're starting to see that in the AR space now. Where yeah. you can look, where you can hold up your phone, and now everything is like it would have looked at a certain time. Like you could be on a battlefield, and you can see yeah. groups in front of you for a couple minutes or something. AR might be the direction that goes first, while we kind of work out the kinks <laughs> with that. And I think maybe you're right. Maybe someday you'll be standing in Pompeii, and you'll put something on, and boom, you're right back to where it looked in 78 AD instead of 79 AD. And I think I'd be really really interesting uh the, the um mark actually has another question was pearl harbor the first that implemented vr Ooh, oh i don't that, know that's a good bar trivia question yeah <laughs> for a history bar <laughs> night uh that might be the one uh chava mara i'm sorry i didn't get to this one uh what is your opinions on dioramas in museums and this leads me to another question then <laughs> oh man uh i think it's gonna get me in trouble at work. <laughs> we won't the, show them. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, miniature dioramas uh, mm -hmm. that show like uh, people in a city or ships in port or something like that, that, that right. gives you an idea of scale that you can't actually get in a museum. Uh, those are always fantastic. Even the ones that aren't that great, I, I love them. They're great. They're covered in dust, they're cool. I dig mm -hmm. it. Yep. Uh, however, life-size dioramas some are fantastic, mm -hmm. some are pretty good, and some are actively terrible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's So the ones that come to mind as fantastic, uh, Museum of the American Revolution, mm -hmm. fantastic. They are so lifelike. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, uh, they're paying for it. It's, it's very difficult to get that level of believability, to get over the uncanny valley. Uh, it's, it's real hard to do that. Some places do it with life casts that are just kept white or gray. Uh, and mm -hmm. those can work okay because, again, it, it blunts a lot of the things that mm -hmm. make them unrealistic. Light mm -hmm. penetration in the skin, individual hair follicles, stuff that's, like, really hard to recreate and really expensive to recreate. You can get right. past all of that if you just make them white or gray. Uh, and some of those, I think, are great. Um, but there's also a lot of f f museum figures that look really bad mm -hmm. <laughs> and oh, it, yeah. it gives such a feeling of artifice that it can rob the display of its authenticity um this makes me think of um i was recently playing assassin's creed valhalla have you played that yet yes yes what's your thought on it i have mixed feelings on it uh which, I which you and everybody else <laughs> yeah yeah i have mixed feelings on it i played it uh probably about four to six hours and I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of done. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was kind of, kind of my feeling too. And at first I thought it was uh, the story, but actually the story is tighter than Odyssey or Origins, the past two games. It's much more consistent. Um, I made myself play more of it. <laughs> oh, <no>. And uh, <laughs> it, it does, they do a really good job of focusing yeah. in on their key themes of chaos versus order mm -hmm. of, um, Rebellion versus uh, um, 
going with the flow, I guess. I know there's a better word for yeah. that, but I can't think of it. Royalty right. or something. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, of these cultures clashing. Right. Um, they, they, don't, they do a good job of focusing on things that they find important. The reason I couldn't even get to that stage was it felt so fake. Yeah. All of it felt so fake. Uh, yeah. Recently, um, Emily, my fiance, uh, played through Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, mm -hmm. which is set in the French Revolution. And it is a bad game. It's broken. Mm -hmm. It does not work. But the world is fantastic. It yeah. is so cool to walk through uh, early Reign of Terror Paris, to see the crowds, to hear the singing, to visit the coffee shops, to watch the plays. Uh, all of those things made the bad combat just something we didn't even care about. We skipped over it as much as right. we could and just right. tried to enjoy the world. Mm -hmm. You can't do that in Valhalla. The world is so fake. It's so yeah. artificial. Everybody feels like a video game character. And it just uh, it takes you out of the experience right away. Yeah, uh, I feel like that's the same thing for bad dioramas and museums. If they're full-size <laughs> bad dioramas that aren't really adding to the story, it right. rips you out of it. It takes you away from this world you've constructed in your head. Uh, and and it creates an uncanny valley that confronts you with its artifice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as a historian, I love the open world games because I can just wander around and, and think and ponder and all this other stuff. And when the narrative is good, I enjoy it. I mean, we're talking about narrative gaming uh, at points throughout the evening here. The narrative, when it's really tight, is amazing. But then when you get into that, you know, thing where it's like, oh, now I got to do this, and I don't yeah. want to do this, <laughs> and that's why I like the open world of Assassin's Creed more, where it's kind of like, okay, you can just wander and go into those coffee shops, as you say, and go into the the stores and the and, and stuff like that, and and the marketplaces, I mean, and 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 hang out and do stuff with that. That hits me more than anything else. I sometimes just buy just so I can explore the worlds rather yeah. than actually take the narrative approach to it i would rather just see how cool they did with the architecture and and mm -hmm. the people uh it's it's really fascinating to think about it that way you know with with as a historian do we like it more just because some of them are open world and we can just wander <laughs> around these places we've studied for a while you know well and that i think goes beyond historians uh as you said video games are a huge industry yep. and historical tourism in games is also a huge industry uh, Red Dead Redemption, I'm going to keep bringing it up. <laughs> Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, their yeah. opening weekend, they made $25 million more than Black Panther made in its entire run. They made $25 yeah. million more than Black Panther in three days. Yeah, that's It great. is the most successful Western of any medium ever. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. L.A. Noir, going further back, yeah. they sold 900,000 copies in the first couple of weeks. Yep. Uh, these are games that are built on exploring a historical world right. uh, to the point that uh, one of the, the criticisms I see from the fans of Red Dead Online all the time, of, well, Red Dead Online and also, because there's an actual side game called Red Dead Online, of the Red Dead game, people who play it and are posting online, mm -hmm. uh, one of their big complaints is we shoot too many people. Like, <laughs> this doesn't feel like part of the world. Why, right. why are we constantly getting into these giant gunfights where right. we kill 30 people? Right. And there's not uh, an immediate consequence for that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It just doesn't jive. That's what's mm -hmm. called ludonarrative dissonance. Uh, when the mechanics you're using to engage with a space contradict the story you're telling. And mm -hmm. uh, you see this a lot in living history experiences mm -hmm. where you're in a space and the way that you're experiencing that world doesn't jive with that world. Um, battle reenactments are a big right. one. Right. Battle reenactments feel completely waste, uh, weightless. There, yeah. there doesn't feel like there's anything of, of real consequence happening there. You cannot right. faithfully recreate life and death situations uh, mm -hmm. with a battlefield. And this is by no means uh, just a, uh, a museum problem. Um, I'm thinking of right. Atun Shea's uh, videos on um, Gettysburg. I don't know yeah. if you've seen those. Yes. Uh, where yes. he's like, if you're not recreating this with buckets of blood everywhere, you're not recreating it. That's right. This is that's the bloodiest conflict mock, that's, in American history. That's why it's called a mock battle, because <laughs> right. sometimes it feels like a mockery yeah. of that. You know, it's kind of like someone asked me that. They're like, are you saying it's a mockery? And I'm like, 
if we brought the originals back and we showed them what we were doing, they would laugh at us, <laughs> you know, and be yeah. like, really, this is it. You know, um, you're getting up and people are clapping. That's not, nice. I say this as a guy who's done those, like who's put right. on the uniform and fired the blanks and marched around and stuff. Right. Yeah. It's fun, but it's not strictly authentic. No. And, and that creates a ludo narrative dissonance. The way in which I was engaging with that as some dude with a musket, uh, it, it contradicted the story I was trying to tell. Uh, mm -hmm. And you do have to be very careful about that kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. in museums, especially when dealing with weighty topics. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also thinking of the Mafia series. Yes. That, came out. that was fantastic because, because you know, they would tell you, oh, you need to go do whatever. But then I'd be like, nope, I'm just going to drive this car around and see, you know, all the neon and do all this other oh, stuff. The music, <laughs> listening to the, the radio. Music. Oh, yeah. And you could change the radio station and, it, and just drive around. And after a while, that got old because it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I've seen every street. I'm just going to go like rob a store or something like that. And it's like, then it got to that point where it's like, well, this is not even now, you know, remotely what it would have been like for me because right. I played it so much in the open world phase. It was like I just got bored. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's kind of that, that, you know, tight rope you walk where it's like, you need to do a little bit of both the narrative and the open world to kind of see, gauge your interest in that, in that certain game or that genre of gaming uh but right. the narrative is just amazing you know well that's something we were trying to replicate with that immersion weekend when i was working at working at london town um was to give an open world feeling to the space mm -hmm. uh all of the people were in character the whole time they were giving activities out um but we tried to make it feel as though the world existed before you arrived and continued to exist after you left now that required i don't know 20 30 volunteers uh, across just three buildings. Uh, yeah. That's something that's important to remember is that while we're using games for inspiration, it's not a one-to-one. -one. We can't just take mm -hmm. the things they're doing and put it in a museum. I mean, sometimes literally you can, like World of Warships, that works. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> Re you know, creating your own programming or exhibits, uh, right. you do have to bear in mind that these are two different mediums, mm -hmm. uh, that video games are worlds constructed for individual people mm -hmm. with very few exceptions, like uh, the Haze Light Studios games, um, It Takes Two, yes. uh, which, by the way, if you have a significant other, play It Takes Two with them, fantastic. It's coming <laughs> therapy. Uh, but most games, the vast majority of games, are meant for a single person to play. And the whole world is constructed for that one person. Even multiplayer games, mm. it's one person on one screen playing that game, and then there's a collection of other people playing their version on their game. Uh, and museums aren't that. Museums are meant for crowds. Most people go to museums with other people. Uh, we cannot afford and should not even try to recreate a whole world for a single visitor. Uh, right. it, it does, it, it's a different scale and, and we have to acknowledge that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you to the new followers, A Pass Kill, Diggity SC, Painting Planets. Thank you for the follow, I appreciate it. We got Kyle on talking about all kinds of good stuff involving museums and narrative game design. I appreciate everyone hanging out. Uh, Kyle, you, you've brought up some of your, some games. What's some, what's like three of your favorites right now that you've enjoyed? Uh, uh, Red, Red Dead, definitely. Red Dead is, you, yeah. You bring it up. One. Yeah, Red Dead. Yeah. Is great. <laughs> yeah. What, what uh, are there's also of? a nostalgia factor to that. Um, so okay. I grew up in Southern California uh, in the mountains in an old gold mining town. Okay. Um, which I'm currently doing a lot of research on. I'd like to eventually someday write something significant about that town as a microcosm of reconstruction in the West. Oh, wow. um, but when Red Dead 1 was being made, uh, or Red Dead Redemption, not Red Dead Revolver, uh, it was created by Rockstar San Diego, uh, which was only an hour down the mountain. Uh, and they drove up and then they went to the deserts beyond. Uh, many people draw the comparison um, of Texas, and that's intentional on the part of the game. New Austin is the name of their, their desert area. But really what it is, is it's the deserts of Southern California with cactuses that shouldn't be there. Uh, that's, that's really all it is. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the inspiration of Western Southern California runs throughout both games because it was so central to the first one. So for me, there's a big nostalgia factor in that. Mm -hmm. But also I think it's a fantastic game. It is easily number one. Um, it's fantastic in Ludo narrative uh, beyond again, like killing hordes of people. Uh, it's, <laughs> right. uh, it's use of disease mechanics. Uh, it's use mm. of... Um, multiple perspectives that your character does not embody. 
Um, there's, there's, I just fantastic. I love it. It's great. Yeah. Everybody yeah. should play it. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Uh, for the number two slot, I'm going to cheat and say the entire Assassin's Creed franchise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, put it all, lump it together. That's fine. Uh, I love it and I hate it. It's, it's <laughs> oh man, it really. What's your, what's your favorite of the franchise? Ooh. Like, like if you had to sit down, you had to play one for the next year. What, oh, which one? Which one would you pick? That's a that's a tough one. Um, I, I think I would one. I would go with Odyssey. Oh, okay. Uh, it's uh, I think because the world is so engaging uh, mm -hmm. and and vast in a way that doesn't feel padded until you're well into the game, uh, and then you start realizing you've been doing a lot of padding for a long time. Yeah, I can see um, that. But I love their discovery tour also their their mm -hmm. museum mode. Uh, which is what I was talking to History Respawn about, was um, the discovery mode in Assassin's Creed games and what museums can learn from it uh, and what games can learn from museums because they needed to learn. <laughs> right. Uh, right. It's it's such a fun world. that's just chock full of interesting characters set at a really fascinating period. Um, I, I really enjoy that one, uh, even though it is way too long, way too padded. Uh, again, love, hate. Assassin's Creed is one of those for me. Um, and then number three, I'd say uh, Return of the Obra Dinn, uh, okay. the game that I mentioned earlier where you're exploring a, a ghost ship and trying to find the fate of the crew. Uh, right. It's a much smaller game. It's much more compact. It's way more focused. Uh, and uh, honestly, a better game all around than any of the Assassin's Creed games. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really cool. I love it. Everybody should play uh, Return of the Obra Dinn. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of it, but I'm going to download it tonight because yeah. I got I to gotta check this out. Uh, where was uh, Mark from Epic uh, brought up? Uh, you love Discovery Tour for Valhalla, releasing the twenty fourth. Looking forward to that then. Oh, is it releasing the twenty fourth? I thought it was going to come out later this year. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm let me color be excited. Uh, yeah. So, in that uh, History Respawn podcast, um, one of the things that I brought up as a disappointment for Discovery Tour because they've done it twice mm -hmm. now for their Ptolemaic Egypt game uh, mm -hmm. Origins. And their um, Peloponnesian Greek game Odyssey. Yep. Uh, and you can tell that they're learning between those two. The first one is very on the rails. Um, there's a mm -hmm. YouTube uh, game design channel called Extra Credits, and they did an episode about this years ago when it first came mm -hmm. out. And uh, they said the problem with Discovery Tour is that it replicates a museum experience. Uh, and I both love and hate that they said that. Uh, because it does, but that doesn't say good things about museums. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was it was really yeah. boring. You could only walk. You couldn't really engage with the world. Um, right. It was just so dull. Right. Uh, and then Odyssey did a much better job. Um, they had more lively characters to kind of bring it along. The world was much much more um, engaging already. Um, even though it was padded, there were a lot of cool places to go. Uh, and they also rounded out the stories a little bit better. Um, there was a lot more focus on uh, domestic events and not just dynastic struggles. And it looks like, from what they've said of Valhalla, they're going to go even further. One of my big criticisms for Discovery Tour on Odyssey was their most boring set of tours were the Battles of the Peloponnesian War, uh, <laughs> which is crazy. No. And that's not how it's supposed to work. Yeah. Uh, they would take you away from your character. You no longer were walking the battlefields. They would go to this big macro level and they would have flags move across the map. Now this is a game that was marketed on these gigantic battles of hundreds of hoplites going and skewering each other. They had all these assets. They put hundreds of hours uh, of their individual workers into it. Thousands altogether, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, work these poor guys to death and the working conditions at Ubisoft are a whole other conversation, uh, not to mention their misogyny. But right. They had all of these things in hand and they just didn't use it at all. None of it showed up. Just stupid little flags on a map. Yeah. Uh, and it was all, it's like the most boring battlefield tours that I know you've been <laughs> oh, on. God. Yeah. Where they're just yeah. talking about this regiment there, and that core here, and like, I don't yeah. care, man. Yeah. Uh, it was very much that. Oh, and no. it seems like from what little they've said about Valhalla's discovery tour, they're going to do more about like, you can actually be somebody doing a mundane task in this Viking world uh, or mm -hmm. in the heptarchy that uh, you'll be carving wood. You'll be making wine. That's really cool. Yeah, that's, that's what cool. they should have been doing from the beginning. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, Mark, Mark said that, uh, Oh no, it's coming out in autumn. So you were <sighs> right, Kyle. 
<laughs> sadly, sadly, you were right, and I mean that because we would love to have had it on the twenty fourth. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, we're gonna have to wait till till autumn with that. And it one. is free for anybody who owns any version of of uh, Valhalla. So like. Uh, uh, the Discovery Tour modes are super cool. Anybody who works in museums should try them out mm -hmm. to get an idea of, first of all, what people think museums are. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, kind of that's what a potential is. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, a good so, start. so get a get a cheap copy at GameStop or, or off Amazon or something, and then it, you'll get the, the Discovery Tour mode as soon as it comes out. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Shavamar put it over den on the list. Thank you for that. Not a sponsor, by the way, of tonight's thing. <laughs> not, not a sponsor tonight. Uh, let's see. I asked what everyone's what everyone's in right now. Uh, Bioshock, Fallout, Vegas, Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper. That sounds cool. Oh, interesting. I haven't seen that. That's Bioshock is also a good example of ludo narrative dissonance. Bioshock Infinite, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the first Bioshock game takes place in a post-apocalyptic society, uh, and so you have to rummage all the time. Uh, Bioshock mm -hmm. Infinite takes place in a vibrant city and you're still rummaging all the time. You're constantly like digging through trash cans and stuff. <laughs> uh, that's that's ludo narrative dissonance. Uh, okay. That's something that uh, as a museum, as you start developing programs based on games, consider that. What are the things that you do because you're a museum? Does that work here? Mm, that's fantastic. Uh, diggity. Can you recommend any esoteric historically based mountain blade mods? Yes, Ooh. I can. Oh, Kyle can, <laughs> yes. Have you ever played Mountain Blade? No, I haven't. I, I need to, apparently. Super cool. It's an old game now. Uh, okay. I know they've, they've made another uh, another one, Mountain Blade 2. I okay. have not played that one, uh, even though it's been out for a couple of years. Um, but the original Mountain Blade was a fantastic RPG, um, quasi-historical. The, the nations are clearly inspired by real people, uh, or real so societies. Um, but it's fantasy altogether. None of the names are real. None of the places are real. Um, and you exist as a noble in this world trying to rise up through the ranks. Uh, it's fantastic. They just love riding on horseback and stabbing people. Um, the best right. historical base mod, and there's a lot of them out there, uh, is Mountain Blade Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it's the inspiration for multiple uh, standalone games that, that came out after that. Um, Hold fast nations at war being a big one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is like the early version of that. Okay. Uh, it, it actually is, I think, literally the early version of that. It, I'm okay. not sure I've, if it's I've done yeah. but uh, yeah, it's it's lots of non combatant roles. Okay. Uh, I remember like even in the early versions of the game, when musicians didn't do anything, they just were there because that's what they would have. People would like fight to be the musicians. Uh, you wanted to be the bagpiper or the hornist or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and you could go and explore parts of the world, even during these big, huge matches where everybody's musketing each other down. Uh, you can go to the church and play the piano, and people would just do that and sit in the pews and watch. Uh, uh -huh. It was a game that uh, indirectly encouraged role-playing and did so tremendously successfully. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a blast. It was so much fun. Totally recommend. Wow. That's cool. Any any other ones that are like that that you know of have come like in that same vein that you've seen come down through? It's like Mountain Blade or I've heard good things about, but not have not yet played. And I should because uh, somebody gifted me a copy. A, a former shipmate of mine gifted me a copy of this Black Wake. Um, okay. Black Wake is a multiplayer pirate game. Uh, it is um, sort of like a less silly version of Sea of Thieves, uh, but still pretty silly. Uh, it's very much focused on the mechanics of like raising sails, having somebody else who's uh, at the wheel, uh, doing all the steps you need to do to uh, load and fire the guns. Um, that was that. That's one that I've heard some good things on that that kind of goes in that same vein of uh, historical recreation. Nice, nice melody. Thank you for being here. Uh, going to our museum live stream. Wow, it must be museum night. Oh the yeah, <laughs> the whale museum. That's really cool. Oh, is that is that the whaling museum in uh, Nantucket? Uh, yeah, it's gone by now, but I'm always yeah. there. there. Yeah, is that is that where you're at, Melody? Let us know before you leave. Hopefully, you didn't already leave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, Washington, Friday Harbor, okay. Washington. Wow, really cool. Yeah, wow. I haven't been to the Northwest in a long time. Yeah, thank you well, for being here, Melody. Another museum to put on the uh, on the checklist. What is this uh, mission? Is about whales in the Salish Sea. Wow, nice, very cool. 
glad to see more museum nerds on here other than just us. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate yeah, you. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, this has been, this has been fantastic. I'm really, really excited for how we can progress as a field in public history with this kind of thing, because I really think we're going to get into more VR experiences and AR is kind of the easier way for museums to start getting involved, believe it or not, mm -hmm. cheaper than <laughs> VR. Um, so I think we're gonna see that. However, I'm looking forward to seeing how we interact post pandemic, like we're opening up yes. now, we're reopening. Our, is our attitude about interactivity going to change? Are we going to see people who who stay away because they see germ theory completely differently than they did <laughs> before COVID-19? Or are we going to see people who are like, I need to get back and I need to interact with these things because I didn't have that for two years? Right. And uh, I, at least speaking for, for my museum, and that is a very small microcosm, um, we are seeing an uptick in, in local visitation. Uh, and we are seeing a lot of people kind of thirsting for conversation. Uh, they still, you're still getting a general trend across museums. Most people prefer to go museums at their own route. They, they don't, they tend not to want a docent, but we are seeing more than usual want that. Uh, and we are seeing people who just want to have conversations with just the front desk staff or whoever happens to be around. Uh, so I think certainly there is a thirst for interactivity, even if our audience isn't, um, stating that explicitly. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people who are locals as well, who are going to local historical sites, um, historical societies and, and small museums now more than they were before because it's local. They can get to it easily. They know the rules, you mm -hmm. know, uh, of, of, uh, are we going to mask or not, or, or are we vaccinated or not? Stuff like that. So they kind of trust their local area more so than traveling right now i found and i've also found that there are people who who are now you know almost forced introverts and they don't know how to interact with people yeah. and they're like i gotta get out and i gotta break the ice and i gotta get out of this shell that i've been in for a while yeah and i think that's something else that virtual stuff and gaming and miniatures and stuff like that can be that gateway to doing that kind of thing because now you're interacting with something in a new way I'm yeah, hoping, absolutely. I'm hoping that creates some more dialogue where you're interacting with that. And then that creates dialogue with the next visitor as well. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think um, games allow historians to have continuing conversations. Museums are a place where, again, this is not a one to one. We can't translate directly from one to the other. There's right. always going to be some change. Right. Museums are a place people tend to visit once. And if you're lucky, they come back once more before the end of the year. Uh, those mm -hmm. are your members, people mm -hmm. who are paying extra to your museum. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes not even them. Uh, so yeah. the thing with games, though, is they demand more of your time. Uh, mm -hmm. um, even Game of Thrones demands less time than Red Dead Redemption. Mm -hmm. uh, it's These are things that you have to keep coming back to if you want to finish them. Uh, which is why a lot of them go unfinished. But these, even the ones that you don't finish, you can devote 20, 30, 40 hours to it before you give up on it. Uh, right. This is a great way to continue conversations uh, as they move along. Um, uh, one that comes to mind is Far Cry Primal, uh, where they had yeah. um, anthropologists develop a um, proto-Indo-European language for it. Uh, and they then developed different dialects of that language to distinguish between factions. Uh, mm -hmm. And that allowed a continuing conversation about what language is, how is it formed. Uh, these guys really did a lot of great work off of that. Uh, and I think there's all sorts of games that, that would allow us to do that. Yeah, I, I truly believe that. Uh, one last thing, Kelly, thank you so much for being here from, from the, uh, the Great White North in Canada. Uh, I'd love to see the live stream historical program continue post-COVID. Nova Scotia sites will be free admission for July and August to encourage. I've seen this in other places, too, where... They just want to get people in the door and they're like, hey, come on in. It's free for this yeah. month or these two weeks is going to be free or 50 percent off or whatever to get people in the door to create more activity. And the one thing that, uh, you know, we can think about with with gaming 
as we log off here in a couple minutes is the fact that sometimes those QR codes that you scan or those cards that you take through and you scan on machines, some of those, and I'm this isn't some tin hat thing, <laughs> Some of those your 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 movements are tracked, and people are like, hey, they this mm -hmm. one has so many hits on it compared to this one, and this one has right. this, and there's more interactivity with this display than this display, and that helps people like Kyle, who who work in the museum field, to be like, okay, why isn't this working? How can we change it to promote come over to this side of the room, and that goes back to the layout, like Kyle brought up about the African American Museum and the the architectural uh, stuff cases and and displays and those static displays we talked about with the uh you know with the, with the dioramas and all that stuff this all goes back to when you're doing some of these things with uh gaming or role playing or just qr coding whatever it may be you're giving automatic feedback and saying hey i don't want anything to do with this display over here i want to be over here where you know many mm -hmm. other people are so it's a great way for public historians in the museum field to figure out what do you like and what don't you like. And uh, we don't think about that when we're going through. We're just interacting. Right. But you're, you are allowing people like us to study it and say, well, they don't like this exhibit as much as they like this one. And uh, it's really, really helpful. You're giving feedback. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Yeah. So please keep doing that. Please keep scanning. Uh, <laughs> but but Kyle, thank you so much for being on tonight. I really do appreciate you hanging out on Twitch. Uh, I know this, this is new for many historians to hang out on Twitch, but we're trying to make it uh, you know more accessible and welcoming for our field because we're over here talking about Red Dead and its historical <laughs> you know narratives and and the story behind that and and all these other games. There, it's just natural that a lot of us hang out on on Twitch and talk about gaming and the interactivity and museums and how we can blend those two together. And I really appreciate you coming on tonight and doing this, Kyle. Yeah. Anytime I get to talk about video games and history, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's great. We'll, we'll get you on a, uh, we'll get you on a, a gaming night too. And we'll, yeah, sounds we'll, like hang fun. Out. we'll hang out, but everyone, please uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you for all the new follows. Uh, Painting Planets, Diggity SC, A Pass Kill, Chalamara, Melody of Green Gables. Thank you all for your new follows. I do appreciate that. You're helping this brand grow and you're helping us bring on more historical programming. And I do appreciate that very, very much. Please be safe out there. Take care of yourselves. We will talk to you very soon. Have a great night.